Hello, I'm Peter Martin, your host for this special Peach 2020 Atlantic Club webinar. Now, I purposely didn't say good afternoon, good morning, or even good evening, as we are streaming this live from, uh, from two both sides of the Atlantic. In fact, our panel of expert speakers are joining us from places as far apart as London, New York, Texas and California. And of course, it's all down to technology, which continues to evolve at pace and is changing the way we go about things in both our personal and business lives. And that is the theme for today, tech, talent and transformation. In particular, we'll be examining how the digital world is impacting two of the most pressing issues facing hospitality globally, talent, retention and customer engagement. We'll explore how technology is transforming both customer experience or CX in new jargon and employee experience EX and how an integrated tech stack is proving to be a game changer for digitally savvy operators across the industry. So let me tell you what's going to happen now and introduce our speakers. We are starting with a focus on the customer, the guest. Uh, with our keynote speaker, former Young Brands executive, and author of a must-read book, Delivering the Digital Restaurant. That's Meredith Sandlin joining us from California. And we'll open up the conversation with our panel of senior operators. Jenny Doyle, Vice President of International Technology of Wingstop, who's joining us from Dallas. John Knight, MD for Leisure and Concessions at the Restaurant Group here in the UK. Martin Williams, CEO and founder of London-based Gaucho and M Restaurants. And then in the second half, we'll be focusing on team engagement um, with an introduction from the CEO and founder of People Platform, Harry. That's Luke Fryer, who's joining us from New York. And then we'll have the panel back to dig deeper into those issues. And Pete Willis, commercial director for Harry UK, will be joining us too. Finally, I'll be summing up with Meredith and that should engage us all through the next 80 minutes or so. But we've got a lot to get in. And of course, we want to hear from you during the day as well. And you'll have heard how you can do that. And I'll be harvesting those questions and putting them to the panel as they come in. But just before we start, let me thank our long-term Atlantic Club partners for making this possible. They are International Design House Harrison, Market Data and Insight Specialist CGA, and of course, Harry. All three sharing our global vision with operations both in the UK and the US. So, to our first speaker, to set the scene, please welcome Meredith Sandland. Well, welcome, Meredith. Uh, let's ask you the first question. I mean, you, I mean, you, you left Young Brands, where you were Chief Development Officer for Taco Bell, to join a ghost kitchen enterprise, and then write your book, Delivering the Digital Restaurant. Uh, I suppose the simple question is why? <laughs> why would you do such a thing? Yeah, I think everyone thought I might be a little crazy when I left the, uh, the world's largest restaurant company to go to a startup where I was employee number four. But I did it uh, very purposefully because I had been the chief development officer at Taco Bell, built about a thousand Taco Bells in that capacity. And as I was doing that, I started to realize that the world was changing and the omni-channel disruption that was affecting retail was starting to affect restaurants. And it seemed to me that we needed to be building restaurants in new ways and in new places. And when I saw Kitchen United, uh, which is the Google Ventures backed ghost kitchen startup here in the US, I knew that they were on to the way uh, the future would look for in particular off-premise restaurants. Uh, so I went over there and set up that business model, raised the initial capital, all those fun things about starting a business. And we kept saying to each other, gosh, I wish there was a book we could just give to restaurants to explain what's going on. Because even the ones who were talking to the ghost kitchen very, very early, uh, right? This was 2018, very early in ghost kitchens, even the ones who were leaning in and trying to experiment with this stuff didn't totally understand the magnitude of the change that was occurring. And so we found ourselves saying the same things over and over again. 
And you know what happens when you wish something existed out in the world and it doesn't, it turns out you have to be the one to make it. So uh, we wrote this book, Delivering the Digital Restaurant, uh, in which we interview about 100 different executives, restaurateurs, uh, food tech executives, prop tech executives, to talk about all the different types of changes that are occurring in the industry and what they mean for an individual restaurant. that change uh, you tracked in the book. Tell us, I mean, you, you talked about the market change, and in particular, the consumers changing. So let's get your thoughts on those. Yeah, for sure. So I, I think most obviously our consumers now demand convenience. And this was certainly accelerated by the pandemic, uh, but it was not caused by the pandemic. It was starting to happen even before. And restaurants are, in fact, one of the last verticals to go through this change. Um, and so all the things that consumers have learned in retail, all the things that they've learned in travel, they're now expecting from restaurants. And, you know, restaurants were last to this change for a lot of reasons. There's a lot of independent restaurants that makes it much harder to push the change through. But even for the big chains, you know, you're talking about a little restaurant individual location that maybe has $2 million in sales uh, and that, you know, possibly has 10 to 20 percent EBITDA margins. And to try to push technology into such a small box is very, very difficult uh, because the technology is so widely distributed. But nevertheless, our consumer wants it. And we've finally gotten to a point where the consumer demands it, plus the cost of the technology is coming down. And when you combine those two things, it's finally taking over the restaurant industry. Now, our consumer uh, basically has something we call, I want what I want when I want it, um, which is a very long acronym with lots of I's and W's. But essentially what it means is that they're used to being able to have an easy, frictionless digital interface and get whatever they want, wherever they want, whenever they want it. And it's a little bit I would say almost confusing to them that they wouldn't be able to do the same in restaurants. And so the change that we've seen over the last few years with the rise of delivery um, and the third party digital platforms and now restaurants starting to put in first party platforms is really in reaction to this consumer desire for ease and convenience. And I've heard a lot of restaurants say things like, well, you know, if VCs would just stop investing, then all of this would go away and we could go back to normal. But the truth is VCs don't like pick an industry and invest in it to try to drive change. They look where the consumer's going and then invest behind the consumer. And that's really what's happening here. So of course, frictionless digital interfaces and delivery are the most convenient thing any consumer could possibly imagine. And that's why it's taking the restaurant industry by storm. So let's talk about what that means in terms of how restaurants will change. They will start to look a lot more like e-commerce businesses. So what that really translates to is I think you can imagine your restaurant experience becoming like your Amazon experience. You know, everyone on this call, we all have a different Amazon homepage and we all have a different Amazon homepage because we all have different preferences, different past purchases different things that Amazon's learned about our behavior over time and what we're likely to buy that causes us to then have different experiences and different recommendations. And once you get into that digital self-service, those things become possible because all that data is there. Suddenly we can have personalization, recommendation engines, even dynamic pricing in restaurants, things that historically hadn't even been possible because now the unknown guest has turned into a known individual with a data history. And we used to have that maybe for our very best customers where the host perhaps knew the best customers and remembered all of that. But now we have it at scale for every single restaurant consumer. That digital therefore enables hospitality at scale. So what our great host used to do for our best customers, technology can now do for every single individual consumer. The other thing all of this will bring is the same thing we've seen in retail and verticals like CPG and apparel, which is direct to consumer brands, micro niche cuisine types, and rapid innovation becoming the norm. Now at Taco Bell, one of the jobs I had was working on the new product launches. And it felt like 
restaurants were really innovative, that we were coming out with new products constantly. But I think that innovation cycle is only going to speed up as we uh, become more able to offer things to consumers in a more specific and targeted way. All of this, of course, depends on data. So the consumer very willingly gives up a whole bunch of information about themselves as they go through and make decisions uh, on our different digital interfaces. This is where our anonymous consumers become known guests. And I think historically in the restaurant industry, we've all done a lot of segmentation work, trying to understand our consumer. Maybe we do consumer surveys. We look at their demographics. We look at their psychographics. And I think what we're finding in e-commerce is that behavioral data tells us a lot more about a consumer than either their demographics or their psychographics. And that's a big advance in segmentation science. So um, I'll give an example. Um, the data chief data scientist at Netflix said, if I look at the demographics of someone and try to use that to predict what kind of TV show they're gonna wanna watch, I am gonna get the wrong answer. But if I look at their viewing history and look at the choices that they've made and use that to predict the next thing that they're going to watch, I will get the right answer. And in fact, you will often find that two people with very similar viewing histories and very high likelihood of the next thing that they're going to watch or choose on the recommendation engine that Netflix puts forward have totally different demographics. And the same is true in restaurants. And as we get access to all of this data, and start to see patterns and the choices that people are making and use those patterns to predict what they're likely to buy next, we are going to get better and better and better at being able to do things like lookalike audience marketing, remarketing, personalizations, recommendations, and importantly, customer level profitability. So that leads to the final change that happens in e-commerce, which is a change in how we think of the economics. Um, of course, as Chief Development Officer at Taco Bell, I cared a lot about unit level economics, right? So we would talk about words like asset turnover ratios and payback periods, things like that, that we're all very used to hearing about in the restaurant industry. E-commerce doesn't work that way. E-commerce cares about something called LTV to CAC. And what that is, is the economics of an individual consumer. How much did it cost me to acquire that consumer? That's the CAC. And then what is the lifetime value of that consumer as they stick with me, they're loyal, they drive repeat and frequency, um, maybe the items that they choose to buy are more or less profitable. And now I can determine the profitability of every single individual consumer and therefore the profitability of each one of my marketing efforts. Now, that all sounds like a lot, uh, but it turns out that more disruption is coming. There's a lot of ingredients here, software, automation, ghost kitchens, plant-based foods, electric cooking. Um, and I think what's gonna happen is that the next winning concept, so meaning to say, you know, QSR was the winning concept and then casual dining was the winning concept and then fast casual was the winning concept. The next winning concept is going to be someone who combines all of these ingredients into an irresistible recipe. Consumers will get more value, more convenience, healthier food, maybe even a lower price. And because of that, the next thing will take off. Well, thank you, Meredith, for that. Um, and hopefully that's uh, something we can, uh, our panel can now get their teeth into. So let me introduce those. Uh, so please welcome to the stage now, Jenny, our virtual stage anyway. <laughs> Welcome to our virtual stage, Jenny, John and Martin. Well, welcome, welcome all. Um, let's get this kicked off. I mean, I think one thing we all know is that our customers and our teams live in this sort of hyper-connected, always-on, personalized, frictionless digital world, which um, Meredith has sort of been describing, um, and their expectations of brands as consumers, and, and we'll talk later about employees, I think is pretty clear as change forever. Uh, and particularly, I think, again, globally, as costs rise, household incomes contract, price pressures loom, and we know the reasons for those. It looks like we're gonna need more tech solutions to tackle those as well. Um, Jenny, let me start with you. Now, Wingstop 
have been one of the Steffi, one of the leaders in uh, moving the digital dial. You know, you, you've announced a, a massive investment. What seems a massive investment of fifty million dollars in tech over the next five years, and that's a big, big commitment. Um, but I suppose the question is, how far is that going to take you uh, as a company down this digital road? And, and what are the main focus uh, focus of your your investment? Hi, Peter. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no, it's a great opportunity for us here at Wingstop. We're really excited. We have a long legacy of believing in technology as a strategic tool to bring great experiences to our guests, our crew members, our brand partners around the globe. So this investment that we started on last year in 2021 mm -hmm. is really letting us take our already digital adoption focus and bring it to life both globally but to a new level, thinking about how we can use some of that real-time data to drive better guest experiences, uh, more insights into profitability and economics, and other ways that we can close the digital gap. We're over 60% in digital sales, but we're not going to stop until we hit 100%. That that's really is quite quite an ambition, and um, but also presumably that's giving you a lot lot of data about your consumers, as, as Meredith was saying. You obviously, your focus is on the international market, but are you, are you tackling the digitization of your, your business differently in different marketplaces, or is it, you know, one main, one main focus? We are taking the opportunity to look globally as we think about our digital journey for our guests and the insights that we can gain as they adopt our digital channels. We have to work with our partners in each market to make sure that we're offering the right digital opportunities for the guests based on the market, whether that's in Singapore or the UK. But we have a lot that we can learn across all of our markets. We've been doing the owned channel digital journey in the United States for many years. We have a healthy database of 27 million users that we're able to learn from and, and take insights from. And now we're willing to and continue the investment to grow those digital journeys and the customer database around the globe. Well, let's let's take that thing about customer database and, and come to Martin. Um, slightly different business, uh, more up, upscale you know, people who don't know M and Goucher, upscale steak restaurants, uh, fundamentally here in here in UK and, and, and mainly in London. Um, but when the pandemic hit, you your business changed, and you took the opportunity to 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 pivot quickly, particularly into the the meal kit market. But that's had a knock on effect into the way I think you 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 think about the digital in terms of marketing and, and and your customer database. Can you tell us a bit about the journey you've been on over the last couple of years and where you've got to? Sure. Um... I think when we first went into lockdown, um, our first priority was how we communicate with our people and how we use technology for that. But I know we're coming on to that. As far as the guest experience and the, the offerings concerned, uh, we, I took a view that basically if we were going to do anything like at home or meal kits or virtual brands, it needed to be sustainable. It needed to be something which was part of their five-year plan, not something which was a knee-jerk reaction to lockdown. We were very privileged to be in that position, but it gave us a much longer-term view and actually helped us strategize investments for the business moving forward. And as, as everybody found, I think, during the various lockdowns, there was a chance to breathe where the business is and just an opportunity to clear your head and think, how can we be more innovative? Uh, how can we extend the the brands? So we did uh, we did virtual brands. We created a new virtual brand called Meet and Bun by Goucher. We bought an Airstream, which created a dark kitchen for us, which is a portable dark kitchen. So we can take that around the country and measure um, how much demand there is. Not quite our core offering, but how much brand recognition we have and for our secondary offering. Um, and then we had some fun with innovation in terms of between lockdowns, we created some champagne robots, which went along with between the and M, took orders, delivered champagne. So it was an opportunity to have a slightly tongue in cheek, um, innovative, active in the restaurant. Got a good PR guest and just 
started to fun at a time where people needed fun. Um, but I think the biggest thing that we did in business intelligence and how that maximizes our CRM, so analyzes sort of how people visit our website in terms of whether they're coming by our SEO, PR um, articles or searches, how long that web journey is, how successful that web journey is, how many page views there are, the timings from going sites to making a booking, or whether the dwell time on that website is a sort of um, discovery of the brand, whether that's Garrett to RM. And then we're able to segment. And um, you know, we were talking earlier about personalized marketing, and that's very much an ambition that we understand each guest, why they visit us, what activation they came for. Um, and we're able to really define, okay, that guest may have come for brunch in the first case, then they, we, we can identify that they really, how do we get them to come into the restaurants midweek for a, a, let's say a set lunch offering. Then as they grow through their career and their lives, they begin become big corporate entertainers. And how do we take each guest? So we have three or four brands within the portfolio. How do we take them on a journey of discovery so that we keep a lifetime of loyalty because with the sort of acquisition value but if if we're attracting those guests with maybe our discovery brands throughout a 30 40 year life cycle of drinking and dining in the uk hopefully we discover all of our brands and up, upgrade or use the brands for different purposes um and we attract the loyalty and it continues yeah um we'll, come, we'll pick up a lot on that uh, going forward but let's, let's bring john in now now when you joined TRG and, you know, you've had an international background, you've you worked for Jamie Oliver organization uh, back back in the day. But one of the first things I think you did was probably commit some board at TRG to invest in better customer feedback and analysis. Do you want to explain a bit about the route you took and, and what are the results you're, you're seeing of that? Yeah. Hi. Good afternoon, Peter. Um, I think certainly when I joined TRG, it became quite clear um, early on in the in, in the in the leisure business that I was looking after, that we we had real difficulty in scaling guest feedback um, in a way that allowed us to impl implement meaningful change. Uh, we we used all of the traditional and and dare I say outdated guest experience methods. We had low volumes coming in. Menu management changes were made using sales data and a lot of subjectivity. Um, we had a long-winded research. Um, process um, and to cap it all off we had a huge CRM database but we struggled to really execute and personalize it um, to, to our guest. So I prepared um, a paper with the team, uh, we presented it to the board um, and we we implemented Young Pingo. Um, we rolled it out, um, it's now live in 126 restaurants across the whole of the leisure estate we will be rolling it out to the concessions estate as well. Um, and what we're, we're finding now just through working with that data is, you know, we get real time menu information. We can, we can get that feedback from the customer. We can see dishes that aren't performing based on customer feedback. We can do a menu change and implement menu changes and correct them immediately if we see that the, the, the food feedback isn't going in the direction that we need it to. Um, we have a single key metric of guest happiness around MPS now. We can measure all of our steps of service. Um, we can talk to the majority of the silent customers who've never been given a voice to be able to talk and share their experience within the restaurant, good, bad or indifferent. Um, operationally, it gives all of our team in the restaurants a purpose and a key focus. Um, we, we measure guest um, and food metrics alongside each other, um, MPS and food scores. Um, and it, it supports the, you know, we, we work in the, the restaurant industry. It's all about consistency. And what Young Pingo allows us to do is allow our restaurant teams to focus on being consistent, giving the guests what they're asking for specific to their restaurant and making sure that they can deliver the data that coming in it's and it is, um really is allowing us through all of the um operational areas in running the leisure business it allows us to make absolutely data fed information yeah. based on what 
Yeah, and it's just in time. Let's open that up. I mean, certainly I want to come, come back to the, the whole issue of uh, understanding data. But, but I think one of the issues, sometimes the kickback you get in, uh, in the industry as well, we don't want um, digital technology to impinge on the experience. I suppose the question I want to ask, is it in today's world that technology the digital world is part of the experience. I mean, Meredith, I mean, you've done the research right across across so many um, so many uh, businesses in the sector. I mean, you know, what is the attitude? I mean, what is your view? Is do consumers see it? I mean, can I say I've got a bit of research here from our partners at CGA, which shows that although in UK majority of consumers still say they prefer interaction with staff to guarantee a good experience. 43% say using tech to book, order, and pay would be their preference, and that has grown quarter on quarter on quarter. So what's your experience? Is that, is that a, an accurate reflection of the global view? Well, you know, consumers do take some time to change. They have established behaviors, and those behaviors have to be interrupted and shifted. And one of the amazing things about the pandemic is that it forced us all to change our behaviors. And then it went on for like two years, right? So all the things that we experimented with kind of became habitual. And we uh, learned that we actually kind of prefer in many ways, you know, having groceries delivered to us, having food delivered to us being able to do a frictionless curbside pickup at a lot of restaurants. Uh, those things were actually pretty nice. And, um, you know, I remember, I'm sure this happened in the UK as well, like 20 years ago when they first put in the kiosks at the airport uh, where you could check in on the screen and, you know, consumers would walk right past them and go up to the, to the counter because they would much rather talk to a gate agent and make sure everything was right. Well, that lasted a little while, you know, they put some people out there to help you with the kiosk and help you learn how to use it. And now I think any of us going to the airport would much rather use the kiosk than talk to a human being, right? So yes, human behavior takes a little bit of time to transition. And certainly when we're used to doing things in a certain way, uh, it's hard for us to imagine how it could be better. But then we're, when we're exposed to it and we try it and we find that it is in fact well-designed it's got a great UI UX. It's got a fantastic way of getting through the process. We see that it's more accurate, that it's faster. We start to get more and more comfortable with it and then prefer it, right? So I think what you're seeing in the numbers is um, consumers who have been exposed to it and have tried it are saying, yeah, actually, I really like this. And the ones that are still the holdouts are maybe the ones that haven't been exposed to it or haven't tried it, or perhaps a segment of consumers that really goes to a fine dining or sit down environment more often than other types of restaurants yeah. and therefore um, really relies on that experience for a human connection. Yeah, Marty, can I bring you in here? Because in, in a sense, you know, your, your, um, your restaurants would be seem to be probably more experiential. I mean, I, I mean, you talked a bit about the journey and you know the information you're getting, but how how does it play with your customers, particularly in restaurants? I mean, how much is technology part of the experience if you're going to Gaucho or 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 M or as it were in the lead up or afterwards? I think. Technology is part of it in terms of the guest journey of discovering the brand before you dine with us. Uh, are you using things like uh, order pads, which are digital now, which we never used to do? Um, if guests want to go into RM restaurants, we have uh, sort of technological fun, whether that's um, linked to Instagram or uh, Bang and Olsen sound systems and videos and screening rooms. It's, but it's not a huge, I think where it becomes, the, the big question I think is if you went back five years and you said to guests, we identify you, segment you, put you in a category, understand what wine you're drinking, track what wine you're drinking and invite you to a winemaker dinner in six months time. They'd be like, big brother, scary, not good, don't like this. Now. I think a guest would much prefer to hear from you from a sort of marketing campaign about something they're interested in yeah. once a month rather than receive 30 blanket emails that they have no interest in. So that's why segmentation and actually understanding the guests, what they eat, what they drink becomes really useful because then you're, you're no longer, you're sending 
5,000 marketing campaigns to 5,000 people, bad. You're selling one marketing campaign to 5,000 people, all different and all segmented and personalized, good. And I, th I think guests appreciate that and would much, and don't, are not as scared anymore about that sort of big brother, they're tracking what I'm eating, yeah. what they're gonna do with it, sell it to Facebook. Yeah, I mean, Jenny, I mean, it, it would seem to me that sort of the QSR market, the fast casual market is, is one where people are probably going to be more used to technology and we've seen those developments of drive through license plate recognition or whatever but but how do you use the data i mean how much data do you need to collect how deep are you going into uh, someone's as it were personality no i think it's as meredith shared i mean there's a lot more now available to us about how the guest might behave with the brand or you know in a broader context you know with the the ways that we message with them and we can improve the way that we engage and we serve that guest you know i think martin's right i don't know that anyone anymore wants uh just generic emails sent to them they want to know that if they're providing us the context about how the guest wants to engage with the brand, that we're listening to that, that our messages are in the channel they want. It's the tone they want. It's about the experiences they want. Uh, we can learn so much about how they interact within the four walls of our restaurant, the way that they interact with us socially, the way that they interact with us through our digital channels. It's really incumbent upon the brands to take advantage of understanding all that and serving hospitality serving the guest in the best way that's expected for each individual guest. Yeah, right, look, I'm gonna hold it there for a minute and I'm, I'm gonna come back to the consumer because there's a lot to talk about there, uh, particularly around um, that development of how you're putting delivery and, and multi-channel together and using technology for that. And I wanna talk to John about concessions as well. But the other, the other part of the equation is, and the people who are still serving people in, uh, in, in our restaurants are, are the staff. So I want to bring in um, now Luke, uh, Luke Fryer, uh, who's the founder of Harry, who's over there in New York. Tell us a bit about what they're finding out from what our teams, our people are wanting from technology. Luke. Well, look, I mean, welcome from New York. I know you've been globetrotting quite a lot, lot, lot this, uh, lot this week. Um, I think the last time I spoke to you, you were in Tokyo, but hey, that's a whole nother story. Um, but obviously, you guys are working as a platform. Your, your technology is interacting with with um, with, with uh, your teams. What are the key things you're getting? from the teams about what employees want from technology and not just because they tend to be younger and digitally savvy. Well, Peter, firstly, thank you uh, very much for inviting us to be part of yet another great event uh, and congratulations on assembling such great speakers. Um, what we're hearing uh, pretty clearly from, uh, let's call it the, the employee audience, um, if, if we try and break this down into three key areas, right? The first thing is, uh, you know, true communication cap capability, um, which means, you know, messaging and, and engaging with our employees. The second thing is, uh, you know, technology's impact on working patterns. And thirdly, uh, it is really how we use technology to reduce grind uh, with some of our, our most important stakeholders being our managers, um, you know, the automation of, of clear tasks. So there's sort of the three things I want to explore with you today um, to, to, to dive into that topic. Well, let, well, let's start with the first one, then. <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, so, if we look, if we if we look at communications, I think you know the everything that happened, especially in the early phases of COVID, it was sort of a, a very stark change in our ability uh, to communicate, especially with our frontline teams. And you know, traditionally, I think we've had. You know, different tools that are often focused on our corporate employees that we extend through to our frontline managers, right? So, you know, our frontline managers, we can communicate via email and sometimes there's different chat groups on our 
on our sort of corporate messaging systems, but actually getting a message through to frontline employees, especially with the realities of COVID, proved to be extremely difficult. Um, and that needed a fundamentally different approach. And you know what we learned there is if communications to frontline teams aren't wrapped around compulsory workflows, so things like getting a, a schedule or a rota, uh, things like seeing you know when they've been paid or the hours they've worked, the fact is that those those messages actually just don't reach frontline uh, employees. We needed to um, you know we needed to rethink how to get those messages through. Uh, and then it was also the same with engagement. How could we how do we truly allow uh, our employees to feel like they're being heard? What is a mechanism beyond sending a, a basic survey that might get you know an eight to ten percent response rate? What is the actual? What, what is the most effective way of, uh, of of truly understanding what our frontline teams are thinking? Um, and that required uh, you know a, 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 an approach that again worked the ability to take a, a pulse check, um, uh, you know. A, 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 employee sentiment uh, health check, if you will, uh, from uh, an employee as part of their core daily workflows. So for example, asking them a question as they clock out or being able to send it through to the same app that they're uh, receiving their schedule on, right? So that, that key notion of I need to listen and I want to be heard uh, has required a really fundamental rethink for a lot of companies. Um, you know, we've been uh, quite busy in that regard. And, and also one of the, the key things that has stymied communication capabilities is um, there are very few tools that actually allow you to map to the audience uh, in a way that's uh, automated. So if someone moves into a position and they become part of a messaging group, uh, you know, the, the need to maintain communication groups, a, a lot of businesses still use something like WhatsApp to communicate to their teams at a restaurant level. Um, obviously trying to maintain those user groups over time becomes very, very difficult. So a lot of challenges around the concept of effective communication that we've, you know, had an opportunity to address over the last uh, 18 to 24 months. I mean, yeah, the other, the second point you made is about working patterns as well. And, um, you know, hospitality is, is seen wherever you work in the world is not, 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 uh, you know, can be unforgiving, particularly on people's social life and private life. The hours are, can be antisocial. Uh, that's part of it. But how can, you know, how are you seeing technology is impacting that? Particularly as, as you were saying that, you know, workers today, staff today do want to be listened to you know, do want to do have a life outside of um, working in a restaurant? I think that the, the key thing we see, you know, we, we try to talk to a couple of thousand uh, employees every quarter through a range of different surveys we take. And I think the key thing people are looking for are predictability and certainty of when they're working and how many hours they're getting. Um, now, across the US, there's a range of different laws um, that, are, that are trying to really hard code these concepts, but beyond legal requirements, you know, it really is just the basic best practices that we need to have in place today. So, you know, if I, if I move into a role or I apply for a job and I say that I'm available at certain times, then you, we've really got to have the intelligence to, to carry over from the hiring environment into the scheduling environment and make sure that we're actually giving employees uh, work windows that suit their lifestyle. I mean, the fact they're working uh, on a shift basis with us generally means they've got something else going on in their lives, be it school or family, potentially another job. And if we're not flexible and respectful of that, um, you know, they're going to they're going to leave us in today's environment. So technology has a really important role there to play. And at the end of the day, it's kind of pattern recognition, making sure that we're consistently delivering the pattern of hours if someone's working, you know, evenings or weekends uh, and the number of hours. Um, you know, we know that if there's a, a, a sudden or significant uh, decline in the number of hours offered uh, to an employee, that's a huge trigger uh, for turnover. 65% of employees in their first six months of employment uh, leave as a direct result of scheduling dissatisfaction. Um, and so having technology monitor the pattern and the number of hours and alert our uh, alert our scheduling managers uh, to, to unnecessary or, or sort of uh, significant shifts is a very, very important part of, of tech's role in delivering yeah. those consistent working patterns. I think it's quite interesting because in a sense, when Meredith was talking about understanding 
behavioral patterns and vaccines humans it's the same same in your teams as well it's not that they are in a particular age group or particular type it's actually how 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 they spend their lives and understanding that now the, the third point you were making is taking sort of t reducing manager grind and i think I think part of that you're saying is that there's a lot of time, perhaps not necessarily wasted, but concentrating on things which uh, yeah, they might not need to do, particularly around things like recruitment. I mean, you know, how, how do you make life easier for a manager to do the things they should be doing? Well, one, one of the more practical as or practical approaches we've seen there, we've been working through this with a few clients lately, is sort of to take a little bit of the accountant or the lawyer approach and to break the working day down into six or 10 minute in increments and actually try and understand where in a block of six or 10 minutes, our managers are spending their time over the course of a day and, and they're into a week. Um, you know, you, you, you need obviously manager buy-in to, to, to conduct this process, but it's really, really valuable to understand where they're spending uh, you know, where they're actually spending their time on such a granular basis. Um, the, the results can be, you know, quite startling. Um, what you'll find is that somewhere between 45 and 60% of a manager's time is spent really churning through administrative or workflow tasks that really can be assisted by automation. Um, and on average, uh, managers are spending somewhere between 20 and 22% of their time just on hiring related activities be it posting jobs or screening people or, you know, conducting interviews or onboarding. Um, and so that view, and it's, look, it's obviously different for all kinds of organisations. Firstly, understanding the scope of manager grind. Um, that's that's probably the first step in the process. But the second thing is, is really taking a view of, you know, where do we have manual tasks and doing something on an Excel spreadsheet does mean it's manual. Uh, by the way, it's not just pen and paper. Um, <laughs> But we generally find that hiring, uh, you know, actually building a schedule, interacting with a schedule once it's been published, as in, you know, responding to people's changes, managing timesheets and allocation of tasks to uh, a team. That's the majority of where managers are spending you know, their time. Now, if we can bring if we can bring technology to bear and let our managers know that their experience is so important to us that we're putting automation in place. It really speaks to their ability to get on with the parts of the job they love the most, serving customers, training and developing their team. And, uh, you know, it, 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 at, at a time when the, you know, hospitality recruitment brand generally has, has obviously suffered, you know, some damage over the last couple of years, we want to be seen to um, really focus on those things that, 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 drive excitement about, uh, you know, through drive excitement around a hospitality career, mm -hmm. showing our managers that we're putting an investment in understanding uh, where they're spinning their wheels, where they've got grind and putting technology in place to solve that uh, really energizes uh, a managerial team. Yeah. Final question. What's next in terms of tech in terms of, uh, for, for teams? what's going to make their life even better and as a result become more efficient and more effective for the business so i think the the the, the first headline there is that uh, you know ai that we we all hear about ai all day long but but how many of us can really point to where ai is actually impactful in the flow of work for our teams on a daily basis it, it just it hasn't it hasn't taken that step yet but um, AI working in the foreground or the background to do things like, you know, predict which employees may be, you know, may be leaving us, right? To predict which candidates will be better for us to hire, to better predict our sales so that we can better align labor. Having AI deliver a degree of delightfulness and, you know, it just works, a sense of this just works. Uh, you, you're going to see that start to happen quite quickly over the next year or two. Um, so AI that's actually impactful, I like to say. Um, yeah. And I think the second thing you'll see is really the the, the harmonize the, the harmonization of 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 tools with what we call within the flow of work, right? So more and more of our managers' daily tasks, of our employees' tasks, integrating into a mobile device so things can be done on the go, uh, but also making sure that. Uh, within existing workflows, many more tasks can be can be conducted. So basically employees have to work in less places 
they can get more done working in less places. I think that'll be the theme for the next two years. Good. Well, we'll look at that. Look, Luke, thanks for your time. Thanks for joining us. Um, and uh, I know Pete's going to be joining us for the next panel. So, Luke, thanks very much. And let's go back to the panel and let's see what they think about um, uh, people in their people in terms of the impact on technology and their work with technology and with the customers. Well, uh, well, thanks for that, from Luke. And I think you know we know that technology is is affecting every every part of the business. It's multi-dimensional, and we just added another one in there in terms of teams. Let me get a sense of um, what you how you are using technology with your te your teams, and then we can loop back to how that's affecting the, the customer as well, and, and develop that again. Let's start with you, Johnny. In terms of you know you put new technology in, you know has that made life easier for, for your 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 teams? How much are you thinking about your teams when you when you bring in new tech? Yeah, I think I think you have to you probably have to wind it back to, to what Meredith and, and Luke have both said. You know, the, the the whole dynamics of what we're doing in hospitality over the last two years have changed immeasurably. Um, and I think during that period of time when we, we weren't trading in restaurants, we, we needed to try and engage with our teams. We needed to find ways to actively make them feel part of the business, albeit we we're all sitting, you know, in, in our homes. Um, being locked in. So during that process, we became more reliant on, on technology. We enhanced our physical capabilities to be able to communicate and talk with the team. Um, and we, we, you know, it, it, it went down incredibly well. Um, and we, we measured that through retention and, and looking at the amount of team we kept in place through that almost, you know, daily communication with them during the two years that we, we were, we had disruptive trading. Um, our retention levels were, were maintained at really good levels and our key people came back when we started opening up our restaurant. So um, by doing that, knowing how to, to communicate and talk, to, talk with our, our colleagues, making sure they felt engaged, then looking at the tools that we use to make their lives easier. You know, we, 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 we do a lot around labour scheduling, productive labour scheduling. You know, we, we make sure that people are putting the simple things like breaks into all of their rotors scheduling people's time. They're listening, again, as Luke said, they're listening to their colleagues to understand what else have they got going on in their lives that would affect a schedule. We've been very good in the past at just doing a schedule that fits the restaurant. Um, we've got to start learning to do a schedule that fits, fits the team, and the team will then be in the best place it possibly can be to be able to give the great service that our guests expect. Um, you know, and again, going into the going into the back of the house, going into to, to the kitchens, and looking at how we can use technology to help us with our yields, to help us with our waste. You know, big big pieces there around our ESG. Being able to have technology to, to actually have that is is key as well. So, um, in answer to your question, Peter, I think you know the the, the operational team, um, operational and and team element of, of digital is probably higher on our agenda at the moment than all of the nice, sexy front of the house stuff. Um, and I think it's difficult to separate those two because everybody just says you've got a digital strategy, but there, there are component parts to what we need to do. Very much back of house, very much, you know, talking, communicating, scheduling. Yeah. And then there's the stuff that's about engaging with our customers um, and giving them that reason to return. Jenny, I mean, we, we started talking about the, the large investment you guys are making at Wingstop. How, how much is that going specifically into technology with your teams, uh, but also about how are you introducing your teams to this, this new world of, of this new digital world of Wingstop? Absolutely. Uh, you know, for us, let's tackle the first part about, you know, how we look at our teams. Every digital en endeavor that we take on, we have to stop and think about the impact to the teams first and foremost. Um, we have to make sure that the experience is going to be not only a delight to the guest, but to the crew as well, because a happy crew 
serves a happy guest. And so as we look at any of our initiatives and how we work towards that 100% digital goal, if we're looking at front of house or back of house improvements, we're always working to optimize that crew experience. So many of our endeavors right now are focused on the crew, but also as, as our team here has talked about, it's also really important right now, we're putting a lot of focus on the managers and how they can engage actively with the crew by both giving them the tools to do that, but then also freeing up their time. So we're putting some focus on that as well to make sure that these enhancements that we're making and the path that we keep our managers on are giving them the adequate time to help their teams through the transition. And we're looking at a lot of different tools to help through that transition, whether that is optimizing tools that we have in place today with some of our digital platforms or introducing new ones. Um, as I think Luke mentioned, the, the need to communicate with the guest, or sorry, with the crew on a regular basis and to keep them informed about what's going on with their shifts or with the, the team that they're a part of is more important than ever. And, and certainly an expectation that we want to provide our managers and our brand partners with the technology to execute against. Pete, let, let me bring you in. Um, Pete Willis, Commercial Director for Harry UK. Obviously, we've heard what Luke said, but you've actually just done, I know, and I think it's going to be uh, published early next week, um, some research with CGA, one of our other partners, on actually what teams want. Do you want to give us a, perhaps a bit of a, an exclusive preview of uh, perhaps some things we haven't talked about which have come out of, come out of that research? What are the two or three things which perhaps we should be thinking about, what they are telling yeah, us? Certainly, yeah, certainly. Um, just want to say thank you very much indeed uh, for inviting us along to Atlantic Club and congratulations on your continued success of the venture. Um, well, over in the States, we'd, we'd heard this uh, over the last two years dur during COVID, um, this, this whole uh, employee experience platform um, and, and it's the, the big shift away from legacy systems and listening to Meredith's acronym of I want what I want when I want it, the I's and the W's for increased consu consumer expectations, um, it's actually the employee when they I want what I want where I want it and where they want it, okay, is they want it, their increased expectations uh, for flexibility in the workplace. So we, we've, we've heard this for the last two years. So we decided to partner with CGA, um, great on a recruitment, retention and engagement um, survey that's coming out uh, on Monday. And it was incredible, the stats, like 88% of uh, the UK uh, employees believe that their employers needed to up the stakes in, in their technology stack. Now, these young people are getting a lot more demanding the last few years during COVID, they've had a lot more flexibility. Um, but as John and Jenny said, it's all about keeping a happy team. So delivering on that, that contract of, okay, these are your hours, making them happy. If they're happy, they're gonna be more productive. If they're more productive, the, uh, the bottom line is gonna improve. Um, but it's all all comes back to the employee um, rather than just shaving a few hours off the um, uh, off off a schedule. That's what true scheduling is all about, and workforce management. Thanks, Pete. Now let, let's go. Let's circle back. I, mean, I think one of the big changes, and it, it sort of started with Meredith as well. The big changes we cannot ignore over the last couple of years is this shift, um, and mainly because restaurants and bars were closed around the world. It's this shift to delivery, this shift to omni-channel, whether it's food kits or, or whatever, which has certainly changed changed our world. So I want to probably get a sense of how you how you think that that's going. I mean, um, Martin, in a sense, you know, you are probably the more traditional restaurant operator, but you move fairly quickly into that that, that food, meal kit, uh, food at home market. How do you see that as part of your business and your brand going forward and how much is technology? I know you already touched on that in a sense in terms of the, the data you're getting back, but is that gonna be a fundamental part of, part of your brand? And if so, is that gonna change the way you, you operate? Yes, so I think virtual brands and uh, brand extensions can feed from a powerhouse brand, which Gaucho is, and that introduces more people to your brand in an accessible way. 
So if people are discovering us, I'll give you an example. So we have uh, two, two virtual brands which are labeled as part of our portfolio. So they mentioned the, mentioned the brand Gaucho within them, um, which are very successful in terms of delivery and delivery, um, which we've now introduced into a, a different restaurant that we have, which wasn't, we just created it. It's called the Crane Tap in Twickenham. And the Crane Tap basically has a menu, which is of M uh, signature dishes, gaucho steaks and meat and bun by gaucho sandwiches and burgers. So we've already started that journey of going, it started as virtual and it became a brand in its own right. And now we're finding it uh, at home, sorry, uh, in restaurants uh, menu. Uh, so we found the brand at home and it's become a bricks and mortar brand. Uh, we're doing a similar thing where we're talking to football stadia of how we can take meat and bun into football stadia. So it all becomes one big cycle of starting with something that is virtual, um, but has longevity and that playing its own part in a introduction to the wider portfolio of brands. Will, will ghost kitchens be part of your, your operation? Uh, in terms yeah, well, of we, yeah, we, we tried the Airstream that we bought. So that's in essence can either be something that we use at festivals or we can take it as a as a mobile ghost kitchen um, and we're trying three new ghost kitchens this year in sort of affluent suburbs um, to see how that grows the brand Again, it's, tricky. it's a specialist product and it, and it you require specialist kitchen equipment so so it does have its hurdles and we're very consistent, very conscious of uh, brand consistency and not devaluing the brand. I think you can go too far with it. There are there are brands which have taken it to a very extreme level. And for me, I think you always have to bear in mind that uh, people are coming to your restaurant paying a premium for something which is a premium product, has had skilled butchery involved, skilled grilling involved, so all of a sudden, if you do take it too far, if you take steak, for an example, and you take what you bought from a supermarket, which has your brand on it, and you cook it at home and burn it, and then put it on Instagram, this is all tragic. This, you know, it goes back to the days of Pizza Express and people perceive that brand as a, a premium pizza restaurant. Then all of a sudden they went into a supermarket and, uh, and people then perceived them as the best pizza you could buy in a supermarket and stopped going to their restaurants. And they've had a whole you know, decade of journey and discovery. So I think there is a limit to how far you want to extend your brands, but with technology insight and intelligence, you can do it in a very clever way, which uh, manages to extend your reach to new audiences with it without devaluation yeah and i mean the point you make actually because every time no matter what you're providing whatever channel is still your brand and every brand you know touch point has to be of the same level and the same experience meredith can i bring you in here because you know you as we started again gave up your career at young to, to get into a ghost kitchen startup i mean how do you see that market developing i mean how big is it going to get how fundamental will it be part of the uh the restaurant scene yeah you know it's actually quite small right now i know we talk yeah. about it a lot and uh it's all very exciting and you see it in the news a ton but at least here in the U.S., less than 1% of total restaurant sales flow through some kind of ghost kitchen. It's very, very early in the market. Uh, and it's actually much more common in developing countries, places like China and India. And the reason is because they don't have the same restaurant infrastructure that more developed nations already have. Right here in the U.S., we've got probably a million kitchens already in place, 600,000 restaurants and another 400,000 uh, you know, what we call B&I, which would be like a corporate dining or um, a, inside of a hotel or something like that. There's just so many existing kitchens and that the problem that I think more developed nations are trying to solve is how do you effectively utilize those kitchens? And that's where you see things like uh, more delivery, more off-premise, more virtual brands, things like that. Whereas the ghost kitchens still here are relatively nascent. 
um, in those developing countries that kind of skip the landline, right? They're like, why build out all of this uh, expensive restaurant infrastructure if the end state is that it makes a lot more sense in most cases for the consumer to get something for takeaway or delivery. Uh, and then let's reserve those uh, dine-in occasions for something that's truly special and amazing. Quite, quite different. Now, as with the cell phone, other countries got to texting and smartphones before uh, certainly the US did but we all have smartphones now and we all text now. So it gets here eventually. And I think the same thing will happen in ghost kitchens where yes, it's very small right now. Yes, it's bigger in developing countries, um, but it will grow and grow and grow because it just makes so much more sense uh, in terms of efficiency and effectiveness for serving the off-premise occasion. Do you, um, is your sense that um, food, food from delivery for ghost kitchens or just delivery general is, is taking sales away from restaurants or is it taking sales away from, say, grocery? Yeah, I think you know, before, debate, the, yeah. Yeah, before the pandemic, it was um, absolutely taking sales away from grocery. And we could see that in a couple of statistics. One was that what we call here in the US food away from home or restaurant food. Uh, exceeded food at home or grocery food um, for the first time in 2014 and just continued to grow and grow and grow um, right up until when the pandemic happened and then uh, people started grocery shopping more. Um, so that's one statistic. Another one is that the average millennial spent, uh, again, before the pandemic, $1,000 less a year on groceries than someone their same age cohort did 10 years prior, right? So just a different behavior as they reach the same sort of age and life stage uh, that that particular consumer was spending less in grocery and more on restaurant. And it primarily came uh, that ad those additional visits in the form of off-premise. Um, if you look at transaction count, again, here in the US for the overall restaurant industry, it's been flat to declining for a long, long time, right? So you've got the um, extra sales really coming in the form of off-premise. Now, the pandemic sort of shook all of that up and threw all of that out the window because everyone changed behavior and said, well, I'm not going to go places. I'm going to get my groceries delivered. I'm going to use a lot more groceries, cook more at home. I'm going to have food delivered. Um, and so it was, it was a very turbulent time where all the data is hard to track. But I think now that we're flipping back into, into quote unquote normal life, we're going to start to see things stabilize. Um, I do think that in places where delivery is extremely pre prevalent, so I would say like Manhattan is a good example of this, uh, that is probably a place where delivery uh, has gotten so common that the restaurateurs would say it's starting to eat into their base business. Um, and they would probably say the tipping point comes when delivery is around 40% of a restaurant sales that's when you really start to see um, some cannibalization of existing dine-in behavior. So at least anecdotally, uh, we have a ways to go before we get to uh, really off-premise being cannibalizing of the base business. John, let me bring you in because you've actually just launched a range of uh, products from your Chiquitos brand into, uh, in, into the supermarket um, into supermarkets. So, you know, what, what's your reasoning for that? How, how are you seeing that balance and part of your your multi-channel approach? It, it, look, it's another route to market. So, you know, we're, we're, we're seeing the restaurant space is getting more and more competitive, um, certainly pre-COVID. Pre um, hopefully it will we'll get back to that post-COVID. Um, and it gave us an opportunity to expand um, the brand into every, every day, everyone's baskets, and, uh, you know, into everyday households. So, um, yeah, it, it was, it was, it's very early days. We're seeing some really good reads coming back in with the relationship. Um, we've got about 20 lines that we've developed. Packaging looks fantastic. Um, we're actually seeing um, an uplift uh, across the piece, across the Chiquitos restaurants. Um, they're outperforming the rest of my leisure at the moment. Now, we haven't got the granular data to suggest it's because we're in all of the supermarkets, but um, it seems a coincidence to me. So we are doing a deep dive on it at the moment, and hopefully if it comes out that that is the case, then we'll expand and we'll, we'll grow that. But, but again, I, I think to Martin's point, uh, we are a restaurant business at the end of the day. Um, we, we don't want to be known for um, you know, being, being a great 
retail business who do restaurants. We're, we're a restaurant yeah. business and that's where our skill set lies. And obviously delivery is part of what you're doing as well. But obviously one of the big issues about delivery is it, it is a relationship with the third party aggregators, whether it's in the States or whether, whether it's in, in the UK, particularly about who owns the data. Because, uh, you know, we talked a lot about CRM, understanding of data more. I mean, is there more you can do, John, about actually recruiting those those people? Because there is a sense that actually, if you use delivery almost as a marketing tool, you know, you've got people trying your, your brand, and that's something Martin was saying earlier. Can, how are you working actively to convert those, and use technology to convert those? Or are you talking to the deliverers of this world and saying, how can we share that data? Because that is one of the big issues, let's face it. I think yes on all counts. You know, the, 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 the problem we all have at the moment is that the aggregator own, owns the customer, but the customer will think ill of the brand if they have a bad experience at their dinner table because the food wasn't brought to them in the way that they feel it should have done. So um, owning that data or being able to engage with that data is crucial for the relationship to mature going forward, I think for all of us. Um, our customers expect our brands to come to them, whether it's through a delivery vehicle, whether it's um, you know being brought to them by a host onto the table, uh, or whether it's click and collect, they, they, they want the same standard. And I think we've got to work certainly in, in, in the coming years far more closely with the aggregators and, and the delivery companies to understand whether we own the data or, or, or they allow us insight to that data. We've got to start using that data so that we can we can attract those customers and keep those customers and and you know if there was a bad experience we can turn those customers back into advocates again because obviously you're getting you talked about the feedback your instantaneous feedback almost you're getting in restaurant are you looking to get the same from your delivery yeah. customers yeah look we we own the customers at, at, at the restaurant so you know that the, that data we we track through young pingo uh since we've launched young pingo we've had over seven hundred and twenty thousand um mps guest reviews come in, we've had 1.6 million food reviews come in. So the data is enormous and we can use that data to do something with it. What we want to try and articulate um, with the delivery companies is if you give us the information on what our guests think um, at point of sale or point of delivery, then we can actually do something about it and we can be more specific and tailor our ranges accordingly um, for that delivery market. Fine. Well, we're coming coming towards the end of our time here, and we probably just scratch the surface, as, uh, as uh, I think Meredith said earlier on. You know, there's a lot more disruption to come. But Jenny, let me bring you back in. Um, and again, you know, you are so committed to this digital future. What? But also, you know, it's interesting about you know Wingstop and the differences you have because I think a lot of people think you're fast food, but it, it's quite interesting in the UK. The food is delivered a lot quicker than it is in the States. It's sort of you know, because it is freshly prepared or whatever. How are you? How are you? Sort of taking that experience and sort of wrapping digital around that, but also in terms of you know what is going to be the most important bits of your business going going forward because of this digital age we live in? Great questions. Now, we, we do have some differences in the the way that we handle cook times in a couple of the countries, but it's a great opportunity for us to learn the best practices. And at the end of the day, we all do the same thing. We're serving great flavor, fresh cook to order to our guests. And we have ways that we can do that uh, to serve the needs of the guests uniquely in the market based off their expectations. Uh, the teams do a fantastic job with that and, and it's definitely a place we're drilling in and looking at how we can continue to learn and apply best practices around the globe and not just in individual markets. But as we look at the continued digital journey, I mean, we, we kicked off this session talking about it. We are definitely, like everyone else, thinking about how we can use technology to improve and enhance the experience for our guests, the guests that know us well, and the guests who are just getting to know us, regardless of how they found us. But we also have to put just as much focus on the experience of the employees, the crew in our restaurants, the brand partners around the globe that support the brand and execute against it every day. We need to make sure that we're giving them the tools to stay connected with the brand, to stay connected with the guest, and to optimize the business to delight their 
crew experience, their guest experience, and to support them being able to continue to grow in their markets. So we have yeah. a, a balance. We have to keep constant look at the balance of where we invest. Yeah. And where, where are we going to see, see that? I mean, are we going to see more drive throughs for you guys? Is it going to be more delivery? Or, or do you know yet? <laughs> or is it dependent on what feedback you're going to get? I think what you can count on is Wingstop has a long history of test and learn. Our investment in technology platforms early on has given us access to real-time data. The platforms we have, the partner networks we have for technology allow us to be nimble. We're going to test, we're going to learn, we're around the globe, and we're going to bring some great experiences to life. Yeah, fine. Well, it's interesting. I mean, I think in UK, we're seeing more drive throughs coming. And I'm just catching some news from the States today that Sweet Green is apparently doing a uh, order ahead drive through so that so uh, uh, the innovation continues um, before I move to Meredith to help me sum up uh, what has been a very wide-ranging discussion I want to go back to Pete because at the end of the day really really cool people are, are our teams and going back to that research which I know we'll be able to download soon as well from uh, your website our website and probably lots of other websites as well. But Pete, it, it, in terms of the teams, uh, you know, you say everyone wants technology, but are there concerns from teams about, particularly as perhaps say, jobs are going to go or whatever, are there, are, is there a downside to this from teams? Is there some, is there some uh, negativity? Well, I, I, don't, I don't think they're, um, they're worried about their jobs going. Um, quite, quite the opposite, actually. They, um, what, what we're actually looking for is um, how employers or operators can actually engage them as whether a, an employee or a candidate through consumerizing work, like workplace technology. I don't think, you know, all the sort of robotics is actually going to take their place. And, and after all, both in the US and the UK, um, there's, there's a huge shortage of candidates. So. Um, I, I, I don't think that's their concern. I think the concern is actually make hospitality an, an incredible, incredibly vibrant and um, happy place to work in. And in order to do that, you've actually got to give them the right conditions and the right hours. So what, what we're seeing is a huge consumerization of, of the technology in, in, in this hospitality space. Well, it's a, it's a theme that's running through every every bit of the operation, digital technology. So look, for the moment, well, well thank you, Pete. Thank you, Martin. Um, thank you, John. And thank you, Jenny, for your contributions. So we, we covered a, a wide area. We've got a really good, great sense of your, your businesses. So thank you for that. Really, really appreciate your time today. Jenny, let, let's come back to you. Um, you know, you set, the, you set the scene to start with. Um, what has today's discussion taught you? Is it fitting in with, you know, that, that future you, you, you've been looking at in, in the book and the fact that you, you have gone down that uh, the t digital route in your career? Yeah, I think the conversation today really, I've been taking some notes throughout it, has made me think about, again, not just planning for the technology that we want to put in place today and, and the, the roadmap that we have, but as we've talked about the, the impacts of AI, the impacts of the ghost kitchens, the, the changes that are gonna come over the next two years, how can we be further out ahead of some of those and start to test early? I think that's what organizations can't be afraid to do is to do testing where they can to, to learn from those experiences. Maybe a great idea at the wrong time, might be the, just the right idea at the right time, but uh, I think we all have to be open-minded to trying things that we maybe didn't think of two years ago, but we need to be thinking of now. Thank you. And Meredith, um, the book, we have a digital digital restaurant future and we are delivering all that dig digital. You know, what, what's your reflections on, on today? And um, then I say, what's the next book you're going to be writing? So oh, <laughs> what's the future hold? <laughs> yeah, there's a lot to say. You know, my co-author often tells me that our book could have been a trilogy. Uh, but I think, you know, things change so rapidly that we'll continue to talk about them in groups like these, and you'll likely see a bonus chapter and an update on the book coming out from us soon because uh, there is a lot going on. But in the meantime, uh, there's a lot to be said there in the book. Um, you know, as I reflect on this conversation, um, one of the, the questions you asked that struck me most was, 
do consumers actually want tech and restaurants? And I think the answer is a resounding yes, as long as that technology is frictionless and actually makes their experience better. You know, and when Jenny said, what we do is try to use technology to improve and enhance the guest experience, that's the exact right way to see it. And that is why Wingstop is one of the digital leaders in the space. That's why they're in the book. And we interviewed Charlie Morrison and talked to him about what they're doing because they're not doing technology for technology's sake. They're doing it in order to improve the guest experience. And as long as that's your mission, consumers are gonna adopt the technology that you put in front of them for sure. Um, so that's my first takeaway. Um, my second one would be that employees are consumers, right? So these aren't people who show up at your restaurant and work and then go home and go to bed and don't do anything else, right? They, they do all kinds of things when they're not at your restaurant, including going to other restaurants, shopping online, uh, being Amazon customers. And so they are very well versed in all of these digital things in other aspects of their life. And if they get to your restaurant and it's not digital, they're going to be totally mystified, yeah. right? Because the rest of their life is. And uh, at least here in the US, the uh, typical restaurant worker skews heavily toward a much younger uh, worker than the overall population. And so those expectations are uh, probably doubly so uh, to have a digital experience at work all the way through from hiring to training to their day-to-day -day work life. Um, and then the third one, um, I was really struck by uh, Luke talking about how these tools for the employees are going to become much more integrated. Um, and I love the phrase, uh, being able to accomplish more things in fewer places, because right now there's a lot of point solutions out there and they're great and they're solving problems. Uh, but if a manager has to log in to, you know, eight different things, um, or even if they have single sign on, they're lucky enough to have someone like Jenny, uh, putting together a suite of tools in one place. They have to learn how to use eight different interfaces in order to get their job done. Um, and I, I agree with Luke that over time, we're gonna see that become much more simple. Well, this is a, a topic we'll keep, keep coming back to because it's gonna be a thread which is gonna, gonna run through everything we do in, in the hospitality in, in, the, in the coming years, that's for certain. So thank you, thank you all very much. And ladies and gentlemen at home, um, that is it. Uh, we've come to the end of today's webinar. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, you can order Meredith's book on Amazon and other places as well. And uh, that, those details will be on, on our website and our follow up. The recording of today should be available, will be available on, on Monday. So if you want to come and see it all again, um, you can get it on the Peaks 2020 website. Um, and also we've got some dates for your diary going forward as well. Uh, Atlantic Club's Miami tour is set for May 11th to 13th this year. Um, again, when we're exploring um, new, new concepts, new opportunities. Um, and also our Peach 2020 flagship conference and Hero and Icon Awards is this year on October the 18th uh, in London at Roundhouse, somewhere new. Uh, thanks again, of course, to our, uh, our partners today, Harry, Harrison and CGA. Um, they are always great supporters of us, and they'll be with us in, in Miami as well. You can follow us, of course, on all the social channels. Um, on Twitter, it's uh, um, at peach underscore 20 underscore 20. Uh, so thank you all again. And um, we'll see you soon, hopefully live, uh, but we'll be doing some more podcasts later in the year and presumably more web webinars as well um, and uh, we'll stay in touch and don't forget to uh, watch this again on our YouTube channel. Uh, thank you all very much. See you soon. Bye bye.